and we are recording. Toby Henderson, how are you doing? Good. How are you doing, Dale Holmes? Good, thank you. Good to uh, good to see you. How's things going on uh, over at Box? Uh, going well. You know, I, I think a lot of people know the bicycle bicycle industry is a little slow right now, but uh, we're getting orders again. People are starting to come around, so I see light into the tunnel. But going good. People really love our stuff, and and we're selling a lot of it, so it's good. So when the pandemic came around, did you uh, are you same scenario as everybody? Just sold out of everything, hard to get product, and yeah, what's yeah. Uh... Yeah, that was a crazy, crazy time. Yeah, so there was a point where the warehouse was empty, and I thought we weren't going to make it just because I had nothing to sell, right? Cash was good at the time, but we just have anything. And then, of course, we we're placing all these POs and with two-year lead times. So we had the cash to do it, and we had these long lead times, and then finally stuff started coming, and we're paying for it, and we're going along. And then now the sales are you know, 30%, 70% less, depending upon what it is. So now we have all this inventory. Cash is gone. You know, but everyone, everyone in the industry is in the same position, not just us. We all try to jump on the bandwagon, try to get the product, try to supply, and the supply was late, right? And um, so we all have a lot of inventory right now. When so, do you think everything will get back to normal, if, if it will at all? Well, we all think it'll be above pre-pandemic levels when it does come back. But people are talking about this quarter, next quarter, maybe 2024. We really don't know. But what I've noticed is our distributors are buying regularly, but they're buying much smaller amounts. And mm -hmm. I think that's because they have inventory too. So I see that's good for us. If they're buying our stuff and they're stuck with other people's inventory, maybe that's good for us. But um, they're still buying, just not the levels they were. So they're kind of filling orders, but everybody has full buildings, everybody. And yeah. stuff at the dock. Yeah. Wow. What, what, what do you see the, the BMX industry? What kind of states it in at the moment? I try and ask people here and there and, and, and talk to people. What's your thoughts on everything right now? You know, I, I, I watch it closely. I, I pay attention to moto count. It's something I do. And, of course, moto count and sales, I kind of equate to those, those two things to try to come up with the numbers to, put, to apply a number to it. Um, moto count at January at Vegas was the biggest ever. So I thought, all right, BMX is going to. In 2008, I went through this same thing, right? And uh, and and it, BMX pretty stayed level, you know, more blue collar workers. I don't mean to be that derogatory, but just those people continue to race, take the kids, and and go racing. So I was thinking we'd be see the same thing, but the moto count has gone off a little bit. So you know, um, from those high levels in January. So if we can just stay what it was like pre pandemic, I think we'll be happy with that because the numbers are still okay. Um, but right now I see a little bit of a decline and a lot to do with hotel rooms. I mean, I'm sending my team to hotels or around the place and the hotel rooms are 350 bucks. Yeah. Right? I'm like, what? Is there a game in town? Is there a Super Bowl? What's, what's it's that so, kind of stuff, right? It's yeah. so expensive to go racing now, isn't it? Yeah. It's um, compared yeah. to what we're used to, you know? Yeah. I think that's, that's the biggest uh, hurdle we all have is to, to get the people to afford to go to the track and to, and to, to pay those expenses. Right. So. That worries me a little bit. Yeah, it seems like, and you've always supported the racing. You know, I, I go to the state races now. I always see you guys out there setting up and stuff. And you've always supported. I mean, as far back as I ever can remember, you've always supported national racing teams and stuff. Obviously, that's right. hugely important, and you still support that that theory, right? Yeah, of course. I mean, I think with a lot of the competition that we have, if we're not supporting people, not having that visibility, then eventually somebody else is going to support that team. So it's kind of a game of of who to support, the right people to support to get that most out of your visibility. But of course, that's a risk, right? It's it's intangible and it's risky because you could hire somebody or a team and then they'll, they don't do well. They don't mm -hmm. give the visibility you want, but it still costs you the same. Or you might get lucky and get a guy who doesn't cost you much and done really well for you. I've had a few of those, Danny Kellogg, mm -hmm. out of nowhere, right? And we gave him some stuff. And next thing you know, the kid for 18 months wins every single race there was. Right. And then it falls off. Right. So so it was a great experience with him. And we've had some other riders we've hired and they didn't do well. You know, so, yeah, I think it's a, I think, it's a gamble. I think Danny C is probably the biggest forgotten ABA national number one pro, you know, just because he's pro. not on it's not on social media. <laughs> yeah. I know he's on there, but he doesn't post much in that. It's kind of low profile, you know, but right, uh, people right. forget how good he really was. Yeah. At one time you couldn't beat the kid. Right. Mm. So, yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Now, you've been in the industry a long time, obviously. Your, your career as a racer, you know, factory superstar, BMX action, you know, rally or Raleigh uh, in America, Hutch, you know. Um, 
do you think all that experience, so, and, and obviously one of the first guys on the mountain bike scene with Lopes and King, and you hit the big money times probably with that as well. I think Giant, right? Was that your first big ride? Uh, Iron Horse was my, my okay, long ride, it. and then Giant at the end, yeah. Yeah, but do you think... G- all GT, the- Iron Horse, Giant, yeah. Yeah. You think all that experience as a racer and you took that into business, obviously, after your race career, do you think it all helped with like right up to what you're doing now? Well, really what we do here is we base all the product based upon my, my 20 years of riding. And I literally had a 20-year pro career. So the experience I had of not having the tire I want or the grip shape I want, whatever it is, I just kind of bring that knowledge or that experience, I should say, mm-hmm. to the company, put a good team around us. And, and try to get that product to market. And it usually, I don't know that's cutting edge a lot of times, but I think if you're a, a racer with some kind of feeling of the bike and in tune with the bike, I think our products do you well because of my experience on the bike, bring touching that to the product, I think it's translating to how people do or do not like our product, right? So, but uh, yeah, I think it's what we've been doing for, I've been doing this for a little over 20 years and basically building products from my experience, from a helmet to a tire. And everything in between we've built, right? So you're still yeah. very passionate about it, I can tell, you know. <laughs> I love building product and I love seeing it at the track. And when I had my last company, VSI, I remember going to the track after several years and every single bike literally had something we created on it because it had multiple brands. And uh, now we just have the one brand box. And I go to the races and I see most of the bikes with a box product on it, you know, and, and that's for me, it's inspiring and I guess satisfactory or self satisfaction from that point, right? So. What's the history on Box M? What year did you start it and now it's progressed into yeah, where it is now? Well, uh, 2011, I sold VSI um, and I started Box basically January of 2012. So we're 11th year we're in right now. Shipped our first product October, Halloween day of October, or Halloween day, 2012. 2012. 2012. Yeah, yeah, it's that long ago. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And have you got more future? Like oversized, was that a big a big part of it? You know, is it the is it transitions and changes? You know, I'm not really super techie, so I don't. I, I'm not. I know you are, but yeah, we we. I, like I said, I I. It's funny. Oversized really came from the experience I had on my downhill bike. Mm-hmm. So I'm racing downhill, and I was sponsored by RockShock, and RockShock gave me Lopes, Palmer, Tomac, I think Collie, maybe five, six of us, a boxer fork, and in that fork it was triple clamp, it had a 20 millimeter axle. And the first time I went to a rock garden with that, I'm like, oh, my God, this changes. This is a game changer. So when I came to BMX and started building BMX products, that was kind of my experience. I really was fortunate enough to spend a lot of time um, with engineers, good engineers in the mountain bike side who are bringing these kind of innovative stuff to the sport. And I just translate that experience of working with those engineers over to BMX, right? Um, you know, the 20 millimeter axles, faster tires. These are the things I've made early on in my career, you know, my, my, my business career. Um, but yeah, I think that for box, I think we're getting known for oversized technology. Um, you know, the, the pros really need and understand that with the bigger spindles, bigger axles, how much faster the bike is. And we're trying to beat each other by that much out of the gate. That little bit helps. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and it's starting to be where people are asking for box at the vendors or at the bike shops because of that, that even though they want just a chain tensioner. I think box, even though it's just a chain tension, they'd say, hey, I want a box one because it's got to be good because of that whole part of, of our oversized technology. So we're really playing that up right now and, and, and taking advantage of what we put in because every single thing that box makes is from a tool that we created. We don't buy anything off of TBG, which in the bike industry, there's a lot of books you can buy stuff from and put your name on. A lot of companies do that. We have nothing in the building that comes out of a book. Everything's created from scratch. And we have over 700 SKUs here, so oh, well. quite a range of quite a range of products. I'm sure you thought about it, but you've never really done a frame, have you? Uh, well, I'm involved with Race Inc. Yeah. I have a partner in that, so I I got involved with Race Inc. for one reason is to get the frame makers to follow a component maker is very difficult. So you got to get the frame guy to believe in your component, then you got to wait for the sales and you got to promote it together and. And I was struggling with a lot of great partnerships like DK and Haro and these guys. I had some partnerships with those guys, helping me to create that. But the synergy just wasn't there. So I got involved with ABC and I helped create the new frame that they're promoting uh, under the racing brand and with oversized technology. So we have Carlos Ramirez now. He's racing on, on, the, on the bike. He loves it. And the bike is stiff as can be. And it has all that theory of what we have, oversized technology on the frame. And of course, we're allowing other people to look and be able to buy that same stuff, but they got to change the frame. 
So mm-hmm. I got involved with you know Ray Sink, so I have something to hang my product on. That's our main reason for doing that. Yeah. Is it plans to really grow racing then or just kind of keep it alongside so you can, yeah, back it up with the box? No, no. I mean, I, I, I had intense BMX if, if the, if the, you know, viewers remember that in the oh, yeah. what, 2008 or whatever, we were a five time bike of the year with USA BMX. We sold a lot of frames and a lot of bikes. I'm hoping race Inc has the same experience, mm-hmm. but we got to get that stuff to market. And of course, race Inc was started during the whole COVID thing. Literally the day we put the contracts together, COVID happened I, I, the next day. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's had to ride out that whole four year wave that we, we've been in. So, um, so we've been struggling to get in the product, developing the product. And, and, uh, but we have some stuff on the track that Carlos is doing really well. He got second place last week at the, at the UCI race. So we're yeah. pr- pretty happy with that. And he's extremely happy with the bike and he's has an engineering background himself where he sees himself kind of going there someday when he's done riding. So he's really appreciative of the technology that the two companies are trying to bring to the sport for sure. How did the Carlos deal come about then? Cause obviously he's in Colombia and South America. Yeah, really that's tough strange. To get them guys, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's funny because I have a, a guy that works here at box who's Chilean mm-hmm. and he's working with the Chilean distributors down there. Or, I'm sorry, the Colombian distributors, uh, because he speaks Spanish and the whole South America, uh, uh, uh angle right anyway so this guy just brought carlos was looking for a ride he wasn't happy where he was at and he had a deal on the table and he asked if we wanted something and we wanted a high profile guy he's got two bronze medals right so we wanted a high profile guy and in america we just just didn't have anybody that we could either hook up with or we're interested in so we wound up hooking up with carlos through my my guy here at box and uh we went for it so here we are yeah, no, good yeah. to say. And like you said, he's already on the podium. So that's uh, good, yeah, yeah. good for you guys as well. You know, it's super deep yeah. and hard now. And just to make the main, and yeah. even though he's got yeah. Olympic medals, it doesn't guarantee, you know, nope. top, top results. But yeah, that's good. Good start for both of you guys. Yeah. Um, yeah. What do you, uh, I know you follow closely pro racing and I've talked to you numerous times over the years about it. You know, obviously it's so different now with social media and it's just, it's just not just like, like what we're used to as, as, as the 80s and obviously in my year as well with the 90s. What do you see in the pros? Who do you like? What could they be doing better? Is wow. There, uh... Wow. Yeah, if we kind of, this is not a dirty podcast, but no, we can talk <laughs> about some of those guys, right? You know, mm. I, I, Cam Woods is kind of my favorite at this mm-hmm. point. American guy. I, of course, Nick came in. He's a writer for us. Elise rides for us. Those are our three high profile, other than Carlos, that box, you know, pays money, pays attention to, develops with. They're the first ones to get titanium handlebars or 35 millimeter spindle cranks. Those are the three riders we work with the most. Um, I've tried to touch some of the other guys, but of course the competition's steep, steep too. You have some great companies like the Chase guys and some of these other people that 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 you know that are into the same thing. They're trying to develop products to help the riders go faster. So a lot of the pros are kind of taken from that. Um, and of course we have a lot of South American companies coming up building really good bikes like the BC Cross guys. Their frame is really nice. Um, so I think far as the pros, it's just just those three I mentioned. I, I I'm really fond of those, and they're part of our on our payroll and everything that we do here, and we communicate with those guys regularly. Obviously, Nick's broken; he got a broken collarbone from a few weeks ago. Yeah. Um, Lisa's doing good, uh, but of course, we have a ton of slew of other riders um, uh, right below that too. You know, some pros, but we have a lot of experts like um, Cade. Um, remember, I'm drawing a blank on his name. Cedric. But a lot of Cedric. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so we have a lot of guys like that. Um, yeah, so we put together a really good contingency program. We've been working on it for, we've had it for a while, but we went a lot deeper this time. We're supporting the juniors, we're supporting the super X's, we're supporting every level of anything 17 and over, you can win money from us if you're running box products. So we went really hard and deep on that. The Australians got a deal, um, South Americans got a deal, the Europeans got a deal from us. So you run box, box parts, there's some money to be made for these guys. So. Spent a lot of effort and time on developing that. So. Yeah. You've always been big in the number plate game. How's that going at the moment? <laughs> I don't have any, but uh, uh, that's, just a, <laughs> that's just a that's a cash flow thing or just, I don't know where it's on a dock somewhere. But uh, no, I, I do that for, for promotion. I mean, I think that our plate, um, when I had THE, it was the first three-dimensional plate. It was the Olympic plate. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when I sold that company, I had the relationship with the Olympics and UCI to move the box plate over to that same uh, the world cups um and the world championships and then of course uh the olympics so but then eventually people realize that flat 
stamp plate ain't going to work anymore. So they all started copying. And now I, I wouldn't be surprised there's a dozen three-dimensional plates out there. You know, I still think ours is one of the sexiest. And there's some, a couple other that are pretty good. There's some that are really ugly, in my opinion. But the plate was all about getting our logo to the front of the bike. So it kind of says, okay, I see that plate. What else do those guys have? And then they start to look around a little bit more. You know, the fork, the crank, you start looking at where the logo can be exposed, you know, which is important for us to see that out there. When I owned THE, I mean, that logo right here was just extremely powerful, you know. So uh, the plate was about that. It was about having a powerful place for the logo. And mm -hmm. we, I think we had a sexy one too, so we yeah. still do. Well, I mean, THE, yeah. I mean, we ran those. I mean, that was everywhere, wasn't it, at the time? Yeah, we did. I, I, you know, it's, it's sad that when I sold the company, I was worried about how its success, and yeah, it didn't make it. So yeah, uh, it's uh, it's long gone. But uh, yeah, it was, we had the helmets everywhere for sure. Yeah, yeah no, yeah. absolutely. Um, yeah. What other brands are doing good in your eyes? Do you think? Well, huh? That's a good question, man. I I, I don't know. I, I actually, it's funny when I design because I design most of the stuff here with the help from the engineers and. Uh, I don't look at other people's stuff. As a matter of fact, I really don't research other people's stuff because I think my mind would not go the direction I want to. Mm -hmm. So I don't pay attention to the other guys. I pay attention after they copy us, and a lot of them do, <laughs> like like a three dimensional number plate. I right. pay attention then. Or, or you know, I did create the micro knobby with Intense, and then then Tyago's power block came, and you know, they they're a great tire company. You know, so not you know, and now I've got one that I hope competes with them. So you know, when I sold intense and they came in but i don't know i i just think that they're all a lot of them aren't um as deep as we are like tioga they make a tire and a couple other small parts right um uh yeah it's 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 i don't know i, I guess I, I mentioned the chase guys earlier I, I they have a lot of brands they kind of followed my own hey, hey kid <laughs> they, they 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 followed my own kind of uh business you know model which was a lot of brands and and doing that which i found was very difficult if you have five brands it's five ads and five teams versus one brand mm -hmm. but then i didn't want the components to, to to i didn't want box to have a frame because i do have customers like gt and dk and, and all these guys are my customers right so um i was a little cautious with that but um i don't know I, you know the tangent guys put together some good stuff mm -hmm. um yeah, and then you know, Chase guys put together some stuff. These are guys really innovating. But I see the South Americans doing the same thing. But but um, I don't have. I don't think there's anybody who puts as much effort in the component side as we do. You know, because we make every single part of the bicycle besides the inner tube and the frame box. Literally every single other part and a pedal. So we have everything. So uh, if you want to build a bike, get some tubes and some pedals and you know frame. <laughs> you come to us and build the whole thing At, from three years old to. 35 or 65 years old we have every size and color you can imagine that's where the 700 plus skews come into play right mm -hmm. so. you was always a bit of a image guy yourself you know you had the bleach blonde hair oh, lots of different looks and i say you wrote for great teams and i think the magazines just made you guys in the 80s look yeah i mean you can flip through those magazines now they're just still awesome to look at and stuff what could uh, BMX racing be doing better now for its image and stuff you know like you know wow um, Good question. You know, I also um, have gotten BMX action under my under yes. my, so one of my series questions. of things. So yeah, yeah. Uh, so looking at that and trying to bring that back as a nonprofit, I've had to go comb through the old magazines, mm -hmm. right? And you know, a lot of my photos and stuff I I had brought up. Um, what can we do better? I'm hoping the magazine can create heroes. Or, but then again, we can't go to print because the money's not there. I don't know if people heard about High Torque shutting down a bunch of their magazines last week. The, the money's just not there to keep these magazines afloat. So we're not going down that path, at least of yet. I'm working on something that might work out. But I think it's about creating heroes. I think it's about having those guys to do that. And I don't think the media has done a good job with that, or the pros haven't stepped up to what it takes to be those heroes. But Back in my day, man, there was a ton of heroes at the time. Absolutely, you know, yeah. uh, even even little kids. You know, Jason Jensen, little kid. You know, he's a hero, right? Steve Skibell, way back in the in the late '70s. So, so yeah, creating heroes, I think, is what we really need to focus on, and we need the pros to do that. And I I I, I think a lot of the pros, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I think are, a lot of them are entitled, and they think that they should have more than they have. And we're talking about a sport that's very niche and small at mm -hmm. this point. So if you want to become a pro, you need to know that if you're not in the top five, money's just not going to be there. So you better mm -hmm. be humble, you know, and and, and be able to um, 
and, and get yourself through that. If you want to be that guy, you want to make a lot of money, you got to get to the top five. You got to be one of those guys. You better be in the main all the time if you want to make some money. Yeah. It's tough. Like you said earlier, it's tough. Yeah, no, absolutely. And if, and if you're not, you've got to be really uh, creative and doing a hundred different things to, to, to keep your face out there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the social media has changed things since my day. I, you know, when I, we wound up with BMX Action, the biggest thing was people were saying, I couldn't wait for, for the magazine to come to my mailbox or standing mm-hmm. by the mailbox the day it's supposed to arrive. So this, that, and that stuff's what, two months old, that information, right? So now it's instant. So the whole thing's changed for us. It's, it's an instant gratification of what's going on mm-hmm. um, versus, you know, the excitement of waiting. So maybe we're not excited as much anymore. I don't know. I'm not much of a social media guy as far as combing through it. I'm too busy with the other stuff. I'm a product guy with my heart. So yeah, uh, we need, we need, we need more heroes, better heroes is what I think. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think of the, and I see you guys dipping your toes in there, the, the big bike, um, you know, I see you guys doing stuff with racing. I've seen you on a bike literally. So what's your thoughts on all that? seems like, uh, it's getting a lot of traction in the last couple of years. Yeah, so for, for box, it um, it just kind of came naturally. A lot of guys were buying the SE bikes that came with some cheaper brake, and box has one of the best speed brakes on the market. So the box kind of found its way into the big bike market just by default of a better product. And then when we created Race Inc. and having this heritage, we looked at the whole big bike market and said, oh, we got we to gotta get that. These All these collectors, these guys have a passion for Race Inc. Let's take you know advantage of that with the brand and we made a whole big bike collection. Um, of course it was caught up in this whole, you know, craziness of, of COVID with the bike industry. So it's been a little bit of a struggle. Too many bikes are not in time or these kind of things, but, but anyway, they're doing well. They, they, they're ex- perceived really well in the market. We sold a lot of them and we're kind of happy with that. But what's even funnier was we had the frog town race a couple years ago, which was this old school track. I don't know if you guys know about that, mm-hmm. but um, I went to it, watched whatever, and I thought, okay, so now as our brand racing was taken off, the Frog Town of last year, 2022, I go, oh, I thought I'd race. So I literally took a frame, and when we made the racing bikes, we made them ready for um, oversized technology, but try to keep the retro stalling. That was the whole point behind the bikes. So I took one of the frames out, or the bikes out of the box and switched everything over to box race and race product. Went to Frogtown with this bike, showed up on the starting gate with, you know, the Todd Lyons, Stu Thompsons, and the Perry Kramers of the world. And all of a sudden, they're all looking at my bike like, oh, shit. My bike was completely way more advanced than anybody else's on the gate, right? And my fat old body did pretty really well. I should have probably should have won the thing. It was a me and Stuart thing in the last quarter. And Stuart, <laughs> came, Stuart came out ahead. But uh, but my bike was definitely an unfair advantage. And I think it had a lot to do with I just took this frame. It was ready for oversized technology and put it on there. So after that, we had, oh man, 50 people probably bought the same same setup to turn their bikes into something like that. But I had a 26 inch full blown race bike that rode like a dream. Cause it's, you know, our frames are, are modern frame geometries and 20 millimeter rear hub, 20 millimeter axles, big 35 millimeter spindles, oversized bars. And anyway, my bike was, and of course we're on this track with you can't clip in it's soft there's holes and rocks it's like riding a mountain bike i think my mountain bike career probably helped me with this track right because the track was pretty pretty challenging i mean it wasn't there's no big doubles or anything like that it wasn't like that but there was holes and soft and rock and you know there was no berms it was off cambers it was a a completely different it was like you know in the 70s right so uh, now that's becoming a big thing is where i was going with that we have one Dirty Fest, which is in yes, April. Yes. Yeah. There's one in Texas that BR Anderson's putting on in San Antonio in June. Of course, you know, Frog Tom's coming back in 23. So, yeah, this is becoming kind of a, a thing where all of us old guys, but it's going to be competitive again because I heard a lot of these other pros are starting to, you know, want to do it, starting to kind of get ready for it. And they're all looking for technology. So I'm kind of hearing that because they're coming to me. You know, Stuart, he wants some part from me. And so, anyway, that's kind of fun. It's kind of yeah, it's no, I, I've yeah. been keeping tabs on uh, obviously what Huff was doing last year and all, great footage from, from that event, from what you did. And yeah, just, just great pictures from that event. And obviously me keeping an eye on what uh, Miranda and uh, Eric Carter's doing with uh, this one up here in Tech- Temecula. It seems like it's going to, yeah, it's, it's catching on some some good steam, right? Yeah, Should be a good weekend. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking I saw to the it. track and the track looks uh, 
pretty fast and wide open. So it's going to be like, I said, oh man, I need suspension. I definitely have to change my gear. And yeah, it's going to be, uh, so I'll, I'll be there. I'll race that. And we'll, and we'll, and we're, and ABC is a sponsor of that racing can sponsor that as well as box. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll have a good time. I just think a lot of guys are going to show up a little more prepared this time than before. So, which is a good thing. Yeah. No, looking forward to that weekend. It should be, uh, should be fun. Um, when you have talked before you wrote for Raleigh rally, um, and I, I listened to another podcast where you talked about you actually went there and, and that's where I'm from, you know, just outside Nottingham. Right. My mother actually worked at Rally. And so I was interested in that oh. story. So maybe share a little bit uh, from, like, from your time in England. Yeah, yeah. So that's so. So let's go back a little bit before that. So Jeff Botim and I were driving for DG. Right. And this we thought at the time, this is 78 DG Jersey back there. And, uh, you know, Raleigh comes to us and says, hey, we're you know, you guys want to ride for us. And. Jeff and I are like, oh, my God, we're right for DG. What the hell we want to go to Raleigh for? But they were offering some money that DG couldn't do. So we're thinking, okay, we'll risk this. Let's go right for Raleigh. So lo and behold, I think it has a lot to do with our career and maybe advice to other pros is I was involved with a company that was spending a lot of dollars on ads. So instantly the magazines want to do something with these athletes so they can get those ad dollars. Of course, I had to perform and ride the bike and do my job, and, and we did. So we stepped up to the plate. And we started riding for Raleigh on a kind of a crappy mongoose frame um, is what we rode with Raleigh logos on it. And they were selling those bikes. Mongoose is making bikes for everybody, much like some of the things we have going on today. But anyway, so they started traveling around the world. Right? And the first place we went to was off to Nottingham to, mm -hmm. to do a dealer show. So we went to some hotel studio place or a place and we had a show where we actually came out of this behind the scenes and Bunny hopped over each other's bikes and wheelied and all this stuff on the stage in front of their top 100 dealers. And they had flown those dealers to, to uh, England. I think we were in London doing that show. And um, anyway, so we put on a show, which was kind of, be, I think this, this is 1979. I don't think that stuff's kind of going on by at this point yet. No one at that level, like the size of that company, had entered into the sport and done these kind of things. So Jeff and I were a big part of that whole, that whole scene. So, uh, we, we leave there. We go over to Nottingham. Well, I think on the way out, we go to Paris. Mm -hmm. We start promoting in Paris. They want us to ride in the dirt, but it was mud everywhere. We couldn't ride our bikes. It was kind of like no one knew what to do. We had yellow tuck wheels on our bikes, and this is all <laughs> new, right? So they wanted me to ride down the, the, the Eiffel Tower, right down the stairs. Oh, wow. So we were like Jeez. set to do this. Yeah. I'm going to go ride down the complete staircase. I'm thinking, okay, I don't remember how many stairs it is, 13,000 or something like that, whatever it was. The morning we're doing it, we're there with the bikes, camera crews are there, and the police shut it down. Basically, oh. what I was understood was they didn't want an American guy to do it. They wanted a French kid uh, to do it first. Yeah, yeah some political <laughs> thing like that. Yeah. So anyway, so off to Nottingham we go, and, and wow, the story's at that place. So we go to Nottingham, we get to tour the factory. We get to tour the uh, race team factory, which is when Raleigh was sponsored, Jup, Jup Zutemelk, who had won, I think he'd won the... Um, Tour de France that year, mm -hmm. and just so happened my neighbor was his brother. Oh wow! How crazy is that? Yeah, Dutch guy, right? My neighbor across the street was his brother. Yeah, and I'm in England, and he's riding for that. And we get to go to the shop and see where all these bikes are, seven five three chromolys being made, and and uh, they made us two custom bikes one one for me and one for Jeff. The geometry was horrible, but the thing was light as can be, and mm -hmm. I folded it within like the third ride or something. But uh, <laughs> we got to have that experience. Then they made us road bikes where they measured literally our, muckle, our knuckle to our elbow and our knee to our hip and made us custom road bikes as a favor. We we got those built. 753 road bikes, same exact bike that Youp Zot Milk had ridden in the Tour de France. Uh -huh. So um, anyway, so there, there, I think as I know now, and I, I didn't understand it then, I, I'm 17 years old, maybe 18. I think I'm 17. And um, trying to understand the whole corporate side of this thing and the political part of what they were doing. So you guys had a bike called the Chopper. You yes. remember that? Yes, I had one. Yes. yes. Yeah. So they were so okay. So they said, we have this Chopper bike and we're selling 100,000 of these a year. We're afraid to get into BMX to lose the sales of the Chopper bike. Mm -hmm. Right. And I they said, what, a, what is BMX? What is it really? So now we're in this table, probably 50 people table. You're talking about old school English a boardroom right. with this massive table yeah. and 50 guys sitting around it, right? And asking me, you know, what BMX is. I saw a show at BMX. It's literally, I'm 17 years old. My hair is down to here. I backed up down the hallway on my bike 
and I come hauling ass down the hallway <laughs> and I bunny hopped up onto the table, rode down the table and skidded right up to the president. And I said, this is BMX. Shocked the entire boardroom. I shocked them. Right? I think they probably didn't like me after that point. But I said, this is what we do. They just couldn't grasp it, right? So I said, I did understand from my, my our team manager the whole worriedness about losing this chopper sales. So they said, can you do us a favor? Can you go down to the lab room and see what we do? Why? Because what happened, the chopper started breaking. Mm-hmm. So you guys, you, probably you, was yeah. a kid. I don't know how much younger you are. You're out jumping your chopper. And you're yes. in the forks and breaking the cranks, right? Yeah. So from a lab standpoint, they couldn't figure that out. That's why I did the little stunt, I think. I, I've kind of played. It's been so long ago. But anyway, so we go down to the lab, and uh, they go, here's these choppers. You know, this thing's perfectly fine. It's on this wooden wheel belt with bumps, and there's weights hanging off of it. And it's just, you know, boom, 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 and this belt's going around. And, yeah. things, and it's not breaking. And the guy's like, it doesn't break. We don't understand. They said, give me one. And they had them hanging on the wall there, right, mm-hmm. brand new ones. So I grabbed one off the ground, off the thing. And I came across the floor and I just bunny hop as high as I could, which back then was high hurdle height, right. almost four feet, right? Between half feet, whatever it is. And I jumped and I slammed it down, slammed as hard as I could, three pieces. Toast. One, one yeah, toast. <laughs> the crank broke and the fork bent and uh, some other stuff like that. And his jaw dropped. So they said, okay, tomorrow we're going to have you take a chopper and go out to some ditch behind, you know, the factory. Mm-hmm. And we want you to jump the bike and you know, right, we're going to film you, and we're going to do all this. And at the time, you Zuckamuck had this compact thing underneath the seat, and he had wires to all the frames. This is data data sourcing or data, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Anyway, it was basically data from the flexing of movement of the bike. So they're going to take this chopper, and they do the same thing. They ran wires, and they basically brazed wires to all the areas of the bike. And those wires came up out of the back, but they didn't have this little box that <laughs> Goop had on his bike. They gave me a VCR sized you know, machine and put it on my back and said, we want you to go jump. I'm like, oh my God. I'm talking <laughs> about like a you know, VHS machine. About oh, that heavy, size. yeah. Heavy. And I put this jump suit on. They strapped it to me in. And I went out jumping. And then I instantly went through the cotter pin cranks. They just couldn't keep up with, with what I was doing. And that was be- that made the whole thing come up short. But we, I did. They welded the crank. I kept bending the spindles. They kept fixing the bike and, and trying to keep me going. But I remember it being muddy. And I just remember it was just a ditch. It was some, you know, I just dropping in the ditch and flying out of the ditch and mm-hmm. just making this bike go through its paces. But anyway, so we did that. And off we leave, you know, Nottingham with this custom BMX frame, these custom road bikes. And all this somewhat fanfare. I don't know if it was. I was happy with the boardroom, was happy with my skid on the desk. But uh, anyway, so we get home and I think six months go by and everything's going good. I'm winning races. I've almost won the number one NBL play for Raleigh. We're all over all the magazines. We're getting all this love. I'm thinking, oh man, next year, 81, I think it was. This is going to be great. I think so. That was 79, went all through 80 winning. 81 comes and we're like, oh, this is going to be the best year ever. And all of a sudden we get a call, we're letting you go. Oh. I said, After all I, that. Said, I, should, I, should, I, should, I shouldn't have skid on the desk. I don't know. I was really shocked that they, they let me and Jeff go. And, and basically what I was told was later on that um, they were thought BMX was going to be a fad like skateboards. Mm-hmm. And they didn't want to risk the chopper sales. Wow. So we didn't com- convince them enough. So I went on to ride for Hutch. And later on, obviously, Raleigh came back mm-hmm. when the SCs of the world and all these other people took all this business. And GT came. And Raleigh tried to come back with some other riders and it never was the same after that, right? That the uniforms weren't the same. And I think when Huffy jumped in, they really were like, and Murray, all these guys were jumping in. Raleigh was just, had lost their momentum. But the uniforms that Jeff and I had were very iconic. That never, they never came back. Yes. Still today, I think it's still the best uniform ever. Cause I wasn't a big fan of my stars on my sleeve. Right. Um, when Hutch. I wrote for Hutch, I just wasn't a fan of that. But, but actually the new box jerseys for our factory team have a, icons all over the sleeve trying to get that pop off the track yeah so hutch himself hutch himself was an innovator in product and 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 the way we look and the professionalism we had and so even though i didn't like the stars i think it was very smart of him to give us something that when we went down the track you saw those sleeves you knew it was us yeah no yeah it was in england at the time um just jumping back real quick to the rally thing so even though you left and rally didn't work out in the u.s it went huge in the uk obviously with our history and 
uh, you know, just everything Rally did in the early eighties in, in BMX, you know, right. it was right. uh, a big thing, but, uh, yeah. And, and, and Hutch, I always liked the stars because you could tell who was factory and who wasn't, you know, mm -hmm. so especially in yeah. Europe after you guys came in 83, then I think they start, you started to see a 83, 84, a few guys in, in Holland, right. England and France that had the stars and you just knew straight away that they were, they were right. factory. It just right. stood out, you know, so. Right. Yeah. It was, it was a smart move on their part. And, uh, but I think maybe I learned some of the technology from Hutch too, because my bikes were, uh, really, he was pushing the envelope with magnesium hubs and he tried to go after redline cranks, but we had a struggle with that, but he had a really nice crank. Um, our frames were long, you know, it was probably the longest frames at the time, you know, and they were, the chromoly was good. And yeah, he was, he was definitely a leader in, 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 in the product world for sure. You know, so I was really fortunate to ride for him as well. So, yeah. You came to Europe 83 for the Worlds. I think that's pretty much the only time you raced during that period on Hutch. Uh, what do you remember from Slaghar in 83? Uh, I don't remember results. I thought I had won Cruiser, but I don't think that's the case. I think that Matt Harris had won that. But I remember leaving, doing well in it, but I didn't make the main. I don't know. I, I remember it was just uncomfortable. You know, you're young, you go there. Yeah, I remember when I went there in 79 and trying to eat and try to you know, be, have your warm Cokes and no ice at McDonald's and whatever all that crap is that you go through as a kid, right? Mm -hmm. I remember some of that. Um, I remember, you know, being at the hotel, riding our bikes to the track, but I just didn't have a great weekend on my bike, especially my 20 inch. I remember that. It was probably sleep deprivation or whatever, but uh, I enjoyed it. I remember the, um, I remember the opening ceremonies were huge. You know, also riding around the track with our flags and all that. I do remember that stuff. But, you know, for me, think about when that is. We're, we're at now 40 years, right? Mm -hmm. that, that, how long ago that was, yes. right? So, so you know, that's a long time ago. So, uh, anyway, but no, I, I enjoyed it. I wish we went to more, Europe more often. Obviously, my mountain bike career, I went there all the time and raced. Mm -hmm. So, at that, that point, I'm older and I'm, you know, I dealing with the food and the travel and all that was a lot easier for me. But I think back then, I was just a young punk kid making a lot of money. A lot of stardom and just probably pompous and just didn't you know yeah didn't, didn't enjoy be didn't enjoy being there other than you know the fanfare i remember the kids being crazy for us and trying to rip our the logos off our jerseys and all stuff at the finish line but uh yeah still a good experience you did bercy as well right did, was you on se when you went to bercy 85 ish uh uh 85 -ish. i was on se i yeah. thought i went there for hutch too I went to Bercy twice. So maybe 84, if you could have been on Hutch, right? You Maybe it was Hutch yeah, then. Yeah, and... I want to – I know I went twice. Yeah. Anyway, I, I remember the SE one where I was doing really well and smashed my nuts really bad because track was really <laughs> soft. Yes. Um, but, no, I was writing for Hutch because I remember that I think the first year. I remember it was crazy going to the bathroom. Some lady walks in, lady. <laughs> yeah. I'm in the bathroom at the urinal, which is, you know, yeah, normal. Yeah, I, I yeah, yeah. Came Especially home and in told France. that story. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And she just tapped me on the back and asked me for my autograph, right? right. She didn't care. She was trying to get the <laughs> autograph for her kid, right. you know. And, and I remember going up to the up to the stands, and they had an autograph session. Yeah. And the kids mobbed it. I don't know how many, 15,000 kids or 5,000. I, I think 15, 20,000 people were in that stadium. Yeah. yeah. So so we got mobbed. They pushed us basically back and almost down. They had to take us out this other door because we we're getting mobbed. And, and I remember just touching the paper with the pen. That's all I could do right. as I was getting, you know, push, push, so push many. back. But uh, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was, it was really cool. But that was a good experience. We spent the week there and helicopter rides over the city and all these things they did for us and take us out to, uh, you know, to vineyards and and seeing the how wine was made and went to the Follies Breger to see a, a a play and walk in there and Skip Hess from Mongoose is there mm -hmm. and we all walk in and he looks at me and he goes Toby what are you doing here I'm like what are you doing here he was actually there just on a personal thing oh, and had well, no idea and had no idea we were even in town right I didn't know about the race or anything and we walk into the show you know of course it's you know topless women and all that stuff and yeah and uh which we you know us for us like wow what's that right anyway so um um yeah so that was funny we saw him down I'll never forget that just bumping into him to a show like that but yeah it, it was a really good experience to go over there and, and do that so i think beers was uh that was memorable versus versus slug harden yeah 
Did you do oh. Bercy on when in mountain biking? I know they had a couple of races at Lopes. One uh, was you at any of that stuff? No, I no. I wonder why I wouldn't have been there if Lopes was there. We did this thing in this German tour once. Was basically a, a track, a metal track that traveled around all through Germany. Yeah. Lopes won all of them. There's five of those. I was at that once. I got hurt, cut my knee open really bad. But uh, I did that, which was crazy, crazy track where we. It was all metal. The jumps were like this. Right. And that's right. I went off the jump and I tried to speed jump. It went over the bars and my knee caught a screw in the wood floor that uh, was sticking up. Uh, it just peeled my knee back. Yeah, it was ugly. And then, um, but anyway, that was quite an experience. You know, right, we had to like ride up these ramps, ride down cars. Yeah. It was two, two cars like this and we had to ride down them. And when you got to the bottom car, there was no ramp. You had to like lift up and, you know, Try to get off the car. Save it. And of course, and you're racing against other guys at the same time. So, and then they had the big disco music playing in the background, and huge crowds watching this thing. So, but that was a tour that we went on. Um, but Beersy, I did not race on a mountain bike. I don't remember even that was going on. I don't yeah, know why. they had it like I don't know, mid nineties. I think it was two or three laps around of a BMX. A little bit tougher than a BMX mm. track, I think it was. Two or three laps. I know Lopes was there. Basta Beaver. Uh, maybe Eric mm. Carter, but I remember it was on Eurosport. And that's why I've still got some clips of it back home on some of my old oh, tapes. Okay. But I, I remember yeah. that. Yeah, the Lee Donovan, I think, was there as well. So, yeah. um, well, it kind of goes back to that sponsorship thing I said earlier about how important your sponsor is and the company you write for. You need to, you need to follow. I learned that from BMX when BMX sales started going down. It, the, the sales went to freestyle. Mm -hmm. All the freestyle guys were making the money. I kind of basically lost my job. So what's the next thing I can do? Because I really missed my career and mountain biking started. So I thought, okay, the sales are going towards mountain biking. Let's try this sport. It took me years. I had to change my body, everything to, to become a mountain bike guy. And I struggled in cross country. I got really fit. You know, I lost a bunch of weight. It came really skinny. And I was doing this cross country stuff. And, but I just wasn't making it. And then all of a sudden downhill came. So I had my BMX skills and then I had all that fitness and it just played right into the whole downhill scene, which was took really good care of me for about nine years did mm -hmm. that for a long long time but back to the sponsorship thing my sponsor wasn't as big as maybe some other guys and had no european sales right so if i did if i didn't go there it's probably because yeah the sponsor couldn't afford it or didn't need me there mm. right and just didn't send me right so understand well let's wrap it up toby let's uh i don't know, guess less question last question uh what's the uh, future for box and everything that you're doing Wow. So we're going to stick with oversized technology. We're going to use the race sync frames to, to showcase our stuff. Um, we have the new rear hub coming out, 20 millimeter rear hub we're working on. Um, you know, just a, titanium handlebars seem to be like the coolest thing right now. We still in the prototype stage, but all the pros are got to have them. It literally takes uh, a couple pounds off the front of your bike, changes everything because, you know, you can only run chromoly bars. So we got this titanium one coming, but um, our tire program starting to ramp up. So I think for box and, and, and racing together, we're just going to just push the envelope with the, with the technology and, and grab as much sales as we can and, and hopefully have put a lot of good people around us when it comes to riders and teams and mm -hmm. which we're doing now and just keep that whole thing going and status quo, right? Moving forward. Yeah, right on. Well, I appreciate that, Toby. Yeah. Thanks for chatting. And I'm sure at some point we could probably do another one. I think, uh, again, you have so much to talk about. And uh, maybe we'll... Yeah, obviously. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We can touch base <laughs> yeah. again later down the road. Okay, cool. cool. Hey, thanks for having me, Dale. Thanks, Toby. See ya.